Okay, so the request I got was to talk about the financial instability hypothesis and explaining the, the last crisis. And it, my, my, the thing I can... Hang on, I'm trying to get my mouse pointer to work here. Come on, wake up. What's happening? Okay, now let's see. Not working. Hang on. I'll cheat. Yeah, everything's not working. Okay, that's working. Okay, let's see this. Come on, pardon. Here we go. Right, fine, it's working. Good. Okay. Um, if you think about the way the mainstream behaves, they talk about capitalism minus the banking sector, and people like Krugman just have a lot of fun insulting me for including the banking sector in finance. I want to show you why uh, his insult is water off a duck's back for me because um, you have, if you don't include the, the banking sector, you're not modelling capitalism. It's, it's that profound. So this is the sort of stuff that the mainstream does, and it's based on what they call the, uh, the loanable funds model, where banks are treated just as intermediaries. Whoa, good shot. I was trying to avoid that myself. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So they treat... <laughs> That's a good comedy performance for the evening. <laughs> okay. they, they try to treat banks as just intermediaries, the intermediate between savers and lenders, the sa savers and borrowers. And uh, in the so-called... Uh, a paper that Krugman wrote with a, a DSG model called, a model called Eggertson, uh, in the appendix to the paper, not in the actual paper itself, but in the appendix they bring in banking as they see banking, and they have banking as the life of a single loan contract. The loan is issued in terms of an infinitely uh, last, long-lasting consumer good. It's not actually money, as we were describing earlier. Uh, and they are simply... One agent lends to another agent. The, 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 in, the patient agent lends to the impatient agent. That's the entire vision. But they set up... They extended it here to have the consumer sector being the uh, patient agent, the investment goods sector being the impatient agent. And one thing I thought, all the time they say that only during a period of a financial crisis does a level of debt matter, okay, because in the, in, during a financial crisis it might be that borrowers face constraints that, that, that savers don't face, and therefore when the crisis occurs, one party can't reach, can't balance out an equilibrium what the other party is doing. Now, for a long time I've had to argue on the basis of work by people starting like with Basil Moore. Does anybody who read Basil Moore's 1979 paper? Okay, some reading for you. Basil Moore, 1979, the endogenous money stock. Okay, that's an essential piece of reading. Um, so Basil was somebody who actually did empirically did work and said the money stock must be endogenous, both for practical reasons in terms of how banks actually behave, and then statistically as well, looking at the data. And there are predecessors to Basel, uh, including a, a research director of the Federal Reserve, Alan Holmes, writing back in, I think, the 1960s or 70s, trying to stop the bank falling for monetarism, saying this simply isn't how banks actually operate. Um, but he got over, over, overruled. So I had to quote rebels like Alan Holmes or Basil Moore, and then the whole tradition, including, uh, including Minsky, of course. Now I can quote central banks. So the first was the, uh, was the um, Bank of England pointing out that the whole idea of a money multiplier simply violates the principles of accounting. It simply is not possible for banks to lend out of reserves. The whole idea is just ignorant nonsense portrayed by a profession which hasn't even bothered to understand money and yet tells us how to manage money. So here's the Bank of England saying, first of all, rather than banks receiving deposits, uh, when households save and they're lending them out, bank lending creates deposits. That was the first paper in 2014. I could have fallen over when the Bundesbank came out with a very similar paper, published in German, I believe recently translated into English now, uh, but this is the, the, the press release quoting it, saying, banks create book money just by an accounting entry. And then it says this a wonderful statement, this refutes a popular misconception that banks act simply as intermediaries. Now, the normal story when you're talking about something being a misconception, is something that amateurs believe that experts know is false. In economics, this is something that most amateurs understand that experts get wrong. Okay? 
In this case, the popular misconception is the belief of mainstream economists. And I think it's had a huge impact on how well we understand the economy. The Bank of Norway recently as well. The bank does not transfer money from someone else's bank account or from a vault full of money. So I'm delighted to see central banks taking the lead here. I could tame a certain amount of credit, but I won't. <laughs> um, but I think what's happening is, is something I expected to see happen, and that is that the central banks in particular these days, because they took the dominant role in economic policy, largely on the advice of academic economists that said you shouldn't do fiscal policy, forget about fiscal policy, it should all be monetary policy, and it should be done by experts who are bank, who of course have PhDs in economics, and they should be making the decision just about the rate of interest, only to affect the rate of inflation, forget about employment. That's all the advice central banks took, and they built these enormous elaborate models based on the toy models that people like Lucas and Sargent and Rapping and Kipling and Prescott first put together. And what, I, what I'm seeing in my own work is a similar sort of thing. An academic like myself will come up with a new concept. Okay? It then gets taken on by people who don't, who, who simply think that's, well, they don't know the limitations of the concept, frankly, and therefore they go well beyond it. So what you have is central banks, first of all, get people like Lucas publishing a three-equation model, quite simple toy model, uh, which was the original real business cycle model. And then central banks build these enormous structures on top of that, taking that as gospel and building this huge structure. Yeah? Uh, I just uh, would like to, you to um, briefly comment on the concept of the toy model. Oh, toy, by toy model, I mean an extremely simplified model which is not fitted to data. And which is supposed to do... Yeah, it's, it, it, it's something which is a... Uh, if you like, it's proof of concept. You, you have, you have a, a, a simple model that is not fitted to empirical data, <coughs> that has very small number of parameters and in interrelations. And then that is your uh, way of showing I can build a model of the economy, given the assumptions and the beliefs that I have to begin with. And like, I'll show you one of my, my toy model in a short while. Now, what I've, for example, what I did with you uh, this morning in going through and building that very simple monetary model, that is a toy model. But what you saw that I could have a model of the economy from the point of view of the banking sector, from the point of view of the firm sector, and from the point of view of the household sector, effectively the workers. And I had a very small number of relationships there. That's the toy model. Let's take a look at it again. That's this one. I'll just uh, bring the scale down so you can see it all sitting there. So that's the toy model. Okay. Now, I've done more elaborate versions than this, but that's really, conceptually, that's not a large distance from the biggest model that I built. And then along comes Pedro Pratas, doing his master's degree not knowing what I believed about the inability of the interface to handle um, a more complex model, and he builds this. Bring it up and show it on screen again. As I've mentioned to you, Pedros is now doing a PhD with me, and I'm really looking forward to what he produces. Um, this is the last model that I've taken a look at that he's built. So now, rather than uh, like I've, rather than the three sectors I've got in my model, there are five, including the government, household sector, productive sector, which is in my model the firm sector, financial sector, and the rest of the world. Uh, all those complicated relationships defined there, which are all defined inside the godly tables, but the definitions of the variables are all down here. We're using the flowchart components. That's what I call a serious model. And I've kind of got a uh, one problem with the interface. You notice there's a uh, this thing is there's that little thing there. By accident, and passing over the the pellet here, I accidentally clicked on that object. So that's that's where that little thing has come from. Uh, but that's that's a serious model. If you look at the equations behind it. Those are the equations defining the model. It's five screens worth of equations. Okay. That's a serious model. Um, it's a serious model because it was built 
uh, starting from the toy model that conceptually was sound. That's right. Yeah. As opposed to what is being done in central bank. Yeah. They developed this huge model, mm. but because they are all built on a toy model that has the wrong conceptualization of how the economy works, their all their effort is totally useless and harmful. Yeah. As a that's fundamentally the point. That they, 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 in, in good faith, central bank economists were building models based on what they thought were the great insights of people like Lucas and Rapping and Sargent and so on. Yeah. Uh, just to just to keep um, keep um, like just in order not to uh, understand you wrong, you still think that the central bankers have a right understanding of how they make money. Not all money. central bankers. Not all, but several central bankers are now being brave enough to come out and say, we don't believe what the textbooks say. Okay? You think about, you think about the status relationship between academic economists who get awarded the Nobel Prize okay, and economists working in central banks. There was a real pecking order. The high status was the professors in the universities who got the particularly the ones who end up getting Nobel Prizes, which is people like Lucas Rapping Krugman. Okay? They've got the high status. Staff working in central banks often regard themselves as not being the same status as, as people lecturing at university, let alone the ones who get Nobel Prizes. So in that sense, they saw themselves as taking the tools, the conceptual tools developed by the academics, and making them practical tools by building these huge models but they were accepting that the tools themselves were based on a sound conceptual understanding of the economy. And I'm talking from experience of talking to some of these uh, economists who work in central banks now. So they said they sincerely believed in 2007 that the models they had were an accurate description of capitalism. And they really felt that they were successfully managing the economy and then the financial crisis hit. And they were a complete shock. Where the hell did that come from? Mm -hmm. And now academic economists sitting in their university lecture halls mm -hmm. and university rooms have had the same experience come along as though that was bad management by the uh, prudential authorities. The prudential authorities shouldn't have allowed that to happen. Or well, that was an exogenous shock. Mm -hmm. That was a serious change to preferences and technology. Now, that's Academics have published papers saying the crisis was caused by a substantial shock to preferences and technology, which got bigger over time. You want to see a paper like says that? I'll show you. Hang on. This is Peter Ireland. Let's find it. This, this is this this is the standard of mainstream explanations for the financial crisis. Journal of Money, Credit and Banking. Now, I wouldn't even bother replying and sending a, submitting a paper to that journal. They'd reject my papers unrefereed, and I'm talking from experience on that front. My papers are rejected unrefereed by the American Economic Review and the American Economic Review Macro. Before, one of my published was papers, papers was published in the um, uh, Journal of uh, Economic Dynamics and Control. But here's a new Keynesian perspective on the Great Recession. And... Uh, his explanation for the crisis, I'll search for the word adverse, okay? Okay, yeah, here we go. Here's the explanation for the crisis. The analysis suggests that the 2007-2009 crisis recession had its origins in an aggregate combination of aggregate demand and supply disturbances that quite closely mix, uh, resembles quite closely the mix of shocks that set off the previous Two recessions, the main difference is the series of shocks lasted longer and became more severe. Well, that's really helpful. Okay. So academic economists are willing to state something like that and his, in his conclusion, and I'll just keep on searching for the word adverse, I'll find a few more. Here we go. Okay, panel A, here we go. Panel A of table three indicates that adverse preference and technology shocks now, what the hell does that mean? Well, if you've done any work and if you build a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, you'll know that it has two fundamental components. 
the preferences of households and the technology of firms. And given those, that combination together, you can, you can map out a, point, a bliss point in the future to which the economy is anchored and to which it will converge over time, which happens to be mathematically unstable. So the only way to get there is to be on the stable path. There's one, there's the actual description of that future bliss point mathematically is a saddle. So if you imagine you've got a saddle which extends an infinite direction in space, then in one curve, it's unstable, it's the top of a hill. And the other curve, it's stable, it's the bottom of a valley. Now, if you're going to throw a ball bearing, and I'm not joking because I have a friend who's written the code that does this, that solves these equations. If you're going to throw a ball bearing so that it lands on the saddle and stays there, you've got to land it on that stable arch of the saddle. If you throw it too far, it falls off the other side. Throw it this side, it falls back towards you. So the way these models are estimated is to actually literally, in terms of the mathematical code written by a programmer who lives in the north of, New north of, New north of uh, Sydney in Australia, near a town called Newcastle, um, and he's, a, he's just a math, he's a, he's a programmer, okay? He doesn't believe this stuff, but he wrote the code that does the soft, does the analysis. It effectively fires, takes, takes an arbitrary point on the, on the uh, phase space, of employment inflation phase space, effectively, and fires a bowl bearing, and if it rolls back, he knows he hasn't fired it, hard, fired it far enough, and if it doesn't turn up at all, he knows that it's gone too far, or if it falls off the other side, rather. So only when it doesn't come back does he know he's found the equilibrium path. You know, that's the description of the dynamics. And what, what is going on, there's a saddle in the, in the future and the location of the saddle is given by the technology and the preference uh, maps of firms and households. Then if there's some change to preferences, so people's tastes alter, or there's some change to technology, so the way in which goods and services are made alters, the location of the saddle changes. So if the saddle, saddle shifts in the future, the location of the stable path also shifts. Okay. So their explanation of a, of a business cycle is there's some exogenous shock that changes preferences or technology, and therefore where people were in terms of current consumption and investment, so the labour-leisure trade-off, consumption versus investment trade-off, and so on, that point is no longer the equilibrium point. Okay. So there's now a new equilibrium point, and the economy jumps to the new equilibrium point, and that change in location is the business cycle. And you go from, at all times, the culture to a real business cycle model, the economy is in equilibrium, okay? Because you're looking at a long-run definition of equilibrium now. So if you're in equilibrium, when you're on the long run path, it will take you to the future bliss point. That's, that's the technology behind their models. So the only explanation they have for a crisis is a really big movement in the saddle. What's wrong about that? Pardon? What, what is wrong with that about this one? Because it makes so much sense. What's wrong about it? Where do I start? <laughs> um, the whole vision that we can understand the future. We know the future. Okay? What they call rational expectations, they'll actually describe as forward-looking expectations in their technical papers. And by forward-looking, they mean we take current data and using that current data, we predict where the economy is going to be in the future. And on average, we're correct. Okay? Yeah. That's not rational. That's prophetic. And what is then not... The real world is we don't know the future. It's uncertain. We have no idea. And what we do then is we extrapolate forward the present. And we do it in a world in which money is essential. Money plays a crucial role. Now, they've built a world where that doesn't matter. So because we live in the real world, mm -hmm. okay, when they try to understand what goes wrong in the real world, mm -hmm. the only explanation they've got is a change in preferences or technology. And what is your explanation? Financial crisis which I'm about to show you. Okay. okay. But if you, again, again, this, the, 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 the reaction of academic economists is that we can simply say there are adverse preference and technology shocks and that's enough of an explanation. You try saying that to a politician. <laughs> okay? Now, central bankers find themselves being confronted by politicians all the time because they have to deal with the finance minister or the treasurer 
Yeah? And what, was, what I think happened with central banks is, <coughs> in good faith, they built these elaborate models based on the conceptual frameworks of real business cycle models, and then along came uh, people like, I've forgotten his name now, Wallace, I think, um, and they built the DSGE models, which use the same foundations of real business cycle models, but they are seeing there's frictions. So the frictions slow down how fast you return to equilibrium after, after a crisis. And then when the crisis occurs, they said, well, the exogenous shock actually came from the finance sector, and the reason we didn't see this shock coming is we didn't have a finance sector in our models. So now we have to add in the finance sector into our models, and we add the finance sector in as a source of frictions that slow down how fast we converge to equilibrium again. That's the type of world they're working in. Now, what I want to argue is completely the opposite. The finance sector is an essential part of the economy. If you don't have the finance sector in your macro model, you're not modelling capitalism, firstly. Secondly, it's not just a friction that slows down convergence to equilibrium. It's like a banana skin that accelerates how fast things change, and it causes both booms and slumps. And once you have the finance sector in your model, you can explain where the crisis came from. It becomes obvious that a crisis is going to occur, and it's obvious because of factors that mainstream economics ignores, such as the level of private debt. And once you include that in, it's totally obvious. Yeah? Um, when I was uh, at the University of listening to lectures, and it's like very mainstream university, mm. uh, listening to lectures about what caused the crisis. I, I think um, these technologies shocks weren't mentioned, mm -hmm. but instead uh, the level of, uh, well, the mortgage crisis in the US. Mm. Mortgage crisis, and yeah, that was the biggest reason I was. Yeah, that's typical. That's about as far as they get. And they, but, yeah. But why didn't they say in the lecture or something about this? If this is the mainstream interpretation, and I think that they are really mainstream in my university. Aren't they? Uh, I think they are the professors in my university, very mainstream yeah. researchers, but they didn't uh, mention this kind of explanations. Well, you mentioned they did mention. They didn't mention the technology and uh, preference shocks, but the levels of uh, private household debt in America. Yeah, but, but they, they still see that as a... They, they don't have an explanation that actually looks at the aggregate level of that debt. The best they can do is the sort of thing I'm showing you with Krugman here, where he says it's the um, level of debt. It's, it's the distribution of debt that matters. And this is, this is Krugman on this front. So he's, um, you know, highly mainstream, of course. And he says that the whole idea of an economy being balance sheet constrained, saying this, this is Richard Koo, he's critiquing Richard Koo now, who is a, a, Japanese, a specialist on the Japanese economy. And he says, Koo's vision makes no sense because whether there are debtors, they have to also be creditors. So there have to be some people who can respond to lower real interest rates, even in a balance sheet recession. And he then argues as well, the aggregate level of debt makes no difference. Okay? Because one person's asset is another person's liability, therefore, the level of debt doesn't matter, just the distribution of debt. And that's still the mentality they've got. But I've been arguing for 30 years that the level of debt does matter. Okay? It's essential. The aggregate level of debt matters. And they refuse to listen, and they ignore the level of private debt. So what have they ignored? This. The red line is private debt to GDP in America since 1830. The blue line is private debt to GDP in England since 1880. And the black line is private debt to GDP in Australia since 1940, 1956, I think. And the, blue, the black line from Australian data is entirely recorded by the Reserve Bank. So that's just their actual data. That's their data record. The blue line... Uh, is the Bank of England data until uh, 1980, and then after the crisis, they went back and they extended the data back to 1880. So they didn't have the data before the crisis, they had it after the crisis. The red line is a composite data series I've put together by taking 
uh, Federal Reserve data from 1940, uh, 1952 forward, overlapping it with census data from 1916 to 1970. So there's an overlap where they correlate quite closely in terms of the, the levels, change levels correlating. And then another series for a, a limited number of bank loans as opposed to loans as opposed to, to uh, liabilities, assets as opposed to liabilities, uh, back to 1834. So you look at that, whichever way you look at that data, we are in the biggest debt, private debt bubble in human history. And similar data applies to most other countries. Not Germany, for reasons of its trade surplus, but that's the sort of level we've got in. And they're saying it doesn't matter. Now just to get, just to, let's highlight that the British one is the best example because Look at the level here, 70% of GDP. It never exceeds 70% of GDP on a shortly after 1980. And then it rises from 70% up to over here, let's say 120%, dips a bit in the 1990s, and then rises again to a peak of 190 something percent. And then it falls after the crisis and rises up a bit. America, 170%, falls after the crisis now rising again. Australia, a bit of a dip, and then an increase mm. post the crisis. Now, I still can't get the mainstream to take this data seriously. Why does it matter? That's their answer. I want to show you why it matters. Uh, now, of course, they ignored it. This, on the ba just to set up the scene as to why, the, why I think there's more hope in organisations like the OECD, the IMF, the World Bank and central banks than in academic economic departments before, is that they were the ones who stuck their necks out and made statements like this in 2007. This is the OECD forecast saying that um, there'll be sustained growth, strong job creation and falling unemployment. Now, of course, if anybody was going to be able to predict the future, it'd be this lot, okay? That's what they defined as rational, forward-looking expectations. This is the Federal Open Monetary Committee, Open Money Policy Committee of the Federal Reserve in December, after the crisis began. Still a benign picture, the economy avoids recession. That is now the date on which the recession is dated from in America. Okay? So how did they miss it? Well, they missed that, that bubble of debt because according to loanable funds, it doesn't matter. So I want to show you that in Minsky. So what I've set up here, is a more elaborate version of what you were working on earlier today, and I'm trying to... Where's the mouse got to? There it is, OK. So this is a Minsky model that has the same basic structure as you, were, you built very, very quickly in the morning. Of course, if, you know, if you've got a copy of the presentation, this is now embedded in your slides. But what it has, just to expand it, I have, in terms of the operations that are occurring here, you have bank lending money, bank repayment, interest payments, payment of a bank fee. And the, the vision in loanable funds is banks are intermediaries who arrange a transfer of money from somebody who saves money to somebody who wants to borrow money, and they charge a fee. That's how their bank makes a profit. That's their vision. Uh, then I have the consumer sector hiring workers, the investment sector hiring workers, the investment sector purchasing consumer goods, the consumer sector purchasing investment goods, workers consuming, workers, bankers consuming, and bankers investing. Okay. And so the basic logic is laid out in the Godley table. So for every positive entry, there's a negative. Okay. So all the rows sum to zero. And you have lending is from the consumer sector's deposit account to the investment sector's deposit account. And repayment is in the opposite direction. Interest payments are made by the investment sector to the consumer sector. And the consumer sector pays the fee to the bank. Okay, that's the basic logic. And what I've got, I showed you the idea of time constants and, and varying time constants just before we finished the, uh, the morning session. So over here I've got a control on how fast lending occurs and how fast repayment occurs. And those, those concepts of lending and repayment are defined back on the canvas. Let's just check the canvas and see where they are, let's see. Uh, yeah, here's lending. That's the consumer sector lending based on the amount of money in the consumer sector's deposit account. And that's the investment sector repayment, repaying based on the amount of debt outstanding. So in the one case, the consumer sector 
uh, if, if the consumer sector lent consistently, I, uh, so pardon me, yeah, I can see it's not quite up on the screen. You got it there? Okay. If the consumer sector lent consistently, then in seven years it would halve the amount of money in its deposit account. If nothing else was coming in, that's the basic idea. In, you know the idea of the, the, the time constant that I show you, the, the tangent? Okay. The tangent would cross zero, in, if, with seven being the, the uh, time constant for lending. Then if you extrapolate forward linearly, in seven years, the consumer sector would have lent all its money out. Okay. And then here the debt level, I've got the time constant for debt being nine years. So over a nine-year period, the level of debt would double. Okay, extrapolating forward. And I can change that while the simulation runs. Now what I've got here is the growth rate of the economy, the level of GDP in dollars per year, the ratio of debt to GDP down here, and debt versus the money stock. So what happens when I run the model? You get a growth rate that is zero. GDP flatlines at about 200. The debt to GDP ratio is rising down here. But there's no change in the money stock because changing debt has no impact upon the money stock. Debt, debt in this sense is not a transaction involving the banks. Debt's a transaction between the borrower, which is the investment sector, and the consumer sector, which is the lender. So debt is actually an asset of the consumer sector here. And now if I... Can you just... Let's move this thing slightly that way. We've got a bit of space. That's better. OK, that's better. OK, now if I... Let's see, I'm going to go over here and change. You can't, actually, I'll, I'll drag it over so you can see it more clearly. No. Yeah, that, that's okay, you can see it now. So what I've now got is, I've got the lending and repayment rates up here. I'll actually, I'll just make it a bit, I'll go down to small, hang on, I've got a small scale, where are we? Yeah, now it's all right, yeah. It's going to make that smaller so you can see the whole thing in one go. Okay, so now we've got, so you can see the whole thing there. So what I'm going to do is change the lending and repayment rates and see what happens to the economy. Okay, so let's now have, let's have, rather than loans doubling the amount of debt every seven years, let's have it doubling every five years. Notice the growth rate dipped. And let's have repayment happening much more slowly. Growth rate dips even further. Notice the debt to GDP ratio is rising quite radically. What is creating this? The consumer sector is lending more quickly. And the investment sector is repaying more slowly. Uh, so, uh, how is GDP determined, such as to see this slowdown in the growth of the economy? Well, because the consumer sector has a has a um, higher propensity to consume than the investment sector has. So, because there's a difference in the, the rate at which they spend the money in their accounts, otherwise, the consumer sector lending to the investment sector actually reduces the growth rate. It's a change in the velocity of money, the aggregate velocity of money, because you're going from... It has the way I've set up the parameters here. The consumer sector spends more rapidly otherwise than the investment sector does. So if the consumer sector lends to the investment sector, the rate of turnover of money slows down a bit and you get a dip in the growth rate. But overall, nothing much happens. The simulation has been running for 47 years now and the growth rate dipped a bit and went back to zero again, and it's, the GDP is still running at about 200. There's no change. And notice what's happened to the debt ratio. The debt ratio has now gone from quite a low level. It's still rising in the model. This is actually running extremely slowly. I'm wondering why it's running so slowly. That's right. I've got the banking sector. Let's get rid of the banking sector table. Just hide it. Okay, now we're running more rapidly. That's one of the reasons I want to get the software developed. So the debt ratio continues rising. If I have debt doubling every five years, repayment halving debt every 30 years, the level of debt's going to rise. So there's a huge rise in the debt level here. And the debt ratio is stabilising now at about 200% of GDP, which is pretty much the level of 
private debt that applies right now. What happened to GDP? Almost nothing. Okay. Now what happens if we have a reversal? So we have, rather than doubling lending every five years, what about if I make debt grow really slowly so it doubles not every 30 years? And I then have lending happening, repayment happening much more rapidly. So firms repay quite rapidly. There's the impact. The debt ratio is plunging. Debt's falling dramatically. There's actually a boost to the growth rate of the economy and a bit of an increase in the actual level. But it's all falling back to the same old level again. But that's their vision of lending. Now, could you ignore the banking sector if that was the real world? You could, couldn't you? Huge changes in lending, huge changes in repayment, nothing much happens. That's their vision. I want to show you what happens when you bring in the real world. So I'm going to go back to the initial level where lending is doubling debt every seven years and repayments halving at every nine. That's our initial situation. Okay. And by the way, the simulation has now been running for 460 years. Okay. So I think we can take that as equilibrium. I'll stop it. Stop the simulation now. Let's go inside, looking at the economy from the consumer sector's point of view. Here we're showing the debt as an asset of the consumer sector. That's the loanable funds vision, that debt is not an asset of the banking sector. Well, in Minsky, what I can do very quickly is I can delete that column and say the debt is actually an asset of the banking sector. So I delete debt from there, and I'm going to delete all the financial operations between the consumer sector and the investment sector because they don't exist. They're a fiction. Steve? Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah? Can, I, can, we, can I ask a question before you do yeah, sure. the second yeah. part? Yeah, sure. Um, it seems to me that you are... The underlying theoretical model is so new to me that I am totally lost. Okay. And I don't see at all the link between the theoretical model you are using and the one we all grew up understanding. Yeah. And I want, uh, if you allow sure. me, I okay. because I yeah. think if you help us understand this, yeah, sure. we would have made a tremendous difference in okay. our okay. <laughs> okay. So this is the kind of world we grew up with. Very simple. We say that output is demand determined. What does it mean output is demand determined? Is that output is determined by the level of aggregate demand. Aggregate demand has two components, C plus I, yep. such that this C is mainly a function of Y, mm -hmm. and this I is mainly a function of the interest rate. So this equation is the one that determines the equilibrium yeah. in the goods market, as we know it, and then if we have two unknowns, I need to bring in a second equation that helps me solve the whole system. Yeah. And the second equation is the is the equilibrium in the money market such that MS equal money, supply equal demand, and that demand for money is I, and therefore I have everything I need to understand how the economy is going to work. And that's the famous this is how Mr. Hicks interpreted Keynes, and he said this is what determines the... So, in this world, the level of output is determined by consumption, such that consumption is a function of why. Consumption is not driven by how much people have money or don't have money. It's like consumption is a function of their income, mm. such that the income itself is a function of consumption, as here. I have the impression that you look at the world in a different Totally way. different to that. Yeah. Can you write what are the subs, what is the, an equivalent model to this one that <laughs> yeah. I couldn't start from that set of equations, but I pointed a few things to you, which yes. uh, for a start, this idea that investment is a function of the interest rate. Keynes would say it's a function of expectations of profit. You know, that is true. Okay. But, yeah, that is true. But yeah. okay. So what you've got is a model that, that it only, as Hicks himself realised, there's a, there's a brilliant paper, if you haven't all read it, I think I would like you to all read it. 
called ISLM, an explanation. Now the author is John Hicks. So here's the guy who developed the ISLM model. And in the late, uh, the early 80s, courtesy of debates mainly with uh, post keynesian called Paul Davidson. Did John mention this to you at all? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. He realised the model only works in a complete equilibrium situation. So he said, this idea of an IS curve here is supposed to show you all the levels of income that give you equilibrium in the goods market. And this is supposed to show you all levels of interest rate plus income that give you equilibrium in the goods market. And this one is supposed to show all the points of interest rate and income that give you equilibrium in the money market. Okay. But he said this was actually done as a way of representing a three-dimensional model on a two-dimensional surface. Because what Hicks was actually modelling, he wrote for a study, he said that this model that he shows in... He, he has another paper, you'd all know Mr Keynes and the Classics, yeah. written in 1936. Okay. That's Keynes, Keynes and the Classics, okay? 1936. Hicks explained that he wrote this paper, what he called the Bread Economy paper, the model was actually written in 1934. So it was not a model of Keynes. Mm -hmm. It was a model of Volra. It was a general equilibrium model. Okay. Now, of course, I've read that paper. Mm -hmm. And in that paper, Hicks builds a model of a world in which bread is made in, in ovens and sold on a Monday, and then an equilibrium apply, week price applies for the entire week, Monday to Friday, and then as a result of what happens in transactions over that week, there's a new equilibrium price the following Monday. Now, Hicks never explained in the paper how the ovens were made. So there was no model of production of, invest of investment goods. It was just production of consumption goods. And as he said, his time period was one week. Okay? And he said, when you're working with a one-week time period, it's reasonable to assume things don't change much during that week. When he's working with Keynes's model, he said Keynes's period of time was typically a year. He said you can't assume things don't change over a year. So the whole idea of using equilibrium to begin with said only made sense in a very, very short time period. And then he said when you look at this, this is a two-dimensional model. Now you've got the goods market and you've got the money market. What happened to the labour market? There is none. Why is there no labour market? Okay. Keynes had the labour market in his general theory. Keynes did? Yes. Okay, but Hicks doesn't. Where does labour market go? It disappears down Volra's law. If you're at this point, Volra's law applies. Says law? Volra's law, okay, which is that if n minus 1 markets are in equilibrium, the nth market is also in equilibrium. If you have a three market, if you have a model of money, goods, and labour, and money and goods are in equilibrium, then labour must also be in equilibrium. Uh, but that not necessarily full employment equilibrium. As he defined it back then, it was demand and supply. Labour demand and labour supply. But the whole point of Keynes was to say that... Yeah, but this is not a Keynesian model. See, what model you've been using is not Keynes. It's a general equilibrium in the neoclassical model based on Volra's law. ISLM is a fallacy as a model of Keynes. When I now teach ISLM, I teach it as a model that predates Keynes. It's a macro model of Volrad done by John Hicks in 1934, which was ignored. And so Hicks didn't consciously do this, but when he read Hicks, read Keynes, he saw his own paper. Uh -huh. And he then restated his own paper in a supposed review of Keynes. It wasn't, it wasn't Keynes. You can find elements, because Keynes in the general theory was such a mishmash of Marshallian concepts along with radically different concepts, then you can see some elements which look like Hicks's model in Keynes, and that's what people like Krugman do. Okay? That's what they end up doing. But as Hicks himself said, very clearly, very theoretically, in this paper, published in the journal of Keynes post-Keynesian economics. That's why most neoclassicals haven't seen it. But do you take into consideration that like this intersection of equilibrium points like uh, 
how it is defined usually by macroeconomics, like the uh, definition of the and establishment of market price for the goods. Yeah. It is considered like a market market price just Yeah. But this is just it's, it's typical. It's typical equilibrium thinking. Yes, yes. And as and if it's, it's like going this, upstairs, it's going to be like a surplus of the goods or surplus of the services. Yeah. Yeah. And downstairs, it's going to be like a deficiency. But you can't show that on this map. This is one thing that Hicks himself finally realised, and I yeah, want exactly to get to this particular exactly. point. <coughs> so uh, some two, of, some of the most important works in economics you wouldn't have read include this one by Janos Konai called Anti-Equilibrium. And this particular paper by Hicks, where he realizes this is an equilibrium model. It can't apply at the most interesting times in an economy, when you can't say that a crisis like 2007 was an equilibrium point. But fundamentally, it's forcing into equilibrium way of thinking. Now, what's, in terms of what's wrong with this model, if you think about this as a two-dimensional model, it's only two-dimensional because you can ignore the labor market. You can only ignore the labor market when these two markets are in equilibrium. So the only point that can be regarded as a real point on the diagram is that point. Because in this point, that's equilibrium for the goods market. It's equilibrium for the money market. Therefore, the labor market must also be in equilibrium, and you can ignore it. But if you happen to be here, then the goods market is in equilibrium, but the money market is not. Therefore, neither is the labor market. Okay. So as a model of Volrar's law, Hicks concluded that's the only point that makes sense on the diagram. And therefore, you've got to pretend that the world is in equilibrium at all times to use ISLM. And Hicks said he was no longer willing to make that pretense. I'll show you his conclusion to the paper in a sec. Let's find that here. I actually enjoyed This is great as a way, as a way of doing it because it gets me to pull out ideas that you... Um, that I know that you don't, and it's worth bringing them forward. Now, why is my mouse not working again? There we go. Okay. Ah. Okay. Where are we? I love the opening statement here. The ISLM diagram, which is widely, but not universally, accepted as a convenient synopsis of Keynesian theory, is a thing for which I cannot deny that I have some responsibility. Okay? That's why my actual description of this paper is it's not ISLM in explanation, it's ISLM in apology. Okay? And then at the end of the paper, he concludes, I'll show you the conclusion here. Okay. When one turns to questions of policy, the use of equilibrium methods is still more suspect. You can't prescribe policy without considering the policy might be changed. Okay. Okay. There can be no change of policy as everything has gone as expected if the economy remains in an equilibrium. Okay. He actually writes it better, more than ahead. He's not, not the world's best writer, John Hicks, so he probably says it better. Um, here we go just over these two pages here. That is the formal concept of full equilibrium. The formal concept involved expectations being correct. Okay, so the only definition of expectations that makes sense through time is that your expectations of the future turn out to be correct. And therefore there's no change, reason to change your behavior. Said, but that was the definition that was necessary to get equilibrium. So he said, that's the full concept of equilibrium over time. And then he says, but for the purpose of generating an LM curve, it cannot do because there's no sense in liquidity unless expectations are uncertain. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of the LM curve is a fiction. Okay? Okay. That's the world you've been raised in, and I understand that it's hard to escape from, but that's why you have to. Yeah. And what's going on here is in a monetary sense is that this, in terms of defining a set of equations, this has a certain amount of money in the economy, which is turning over at, at rates you can vary, if you wish. But is it possible to write it in equations? Yeah, this is the set of equations. Okay. Every every Minsky model is a set of is generating a system of differential equations. That's the set of 
the full set of equations here. So, so for example, consumption is a function of... Consumption is invested... You can look up at the top of that up there. I'll just bring it up and show it to you. Income equals consumption plus investment. Okay? I've got a different... <laughs> Okay, so uh, this one we have. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have this one. That's good. So yeah. one, one equation. What? Sorry, can you write on this and this? Then we can hang it. Then we have it. <laughs> Rather than losing. You don't have to, yeah. To, you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I, I don't have very good handwriting. Would you like to write? No. Yeah. Are you going? Sure. If you tell me what to write, <laughs> and I use, <laughs> <laughs> I use this. My writing is Just tell me. Just okay. So why equal C plus I? This equation, we agree on it, yeah. that output is demand determined. Yeah. Okay. Then, what do we have next? Well, I mean, if you want to see the whole list of equations. No, because we need to understand what determines what. And especially what does money do. No, 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 before you write it, that's... Well, I've got all the equations already written by Minsky. So okay. If you want to see the equations, that is the list of equations there. Okay. I, if I was going to take you through the whole model, we'd need more than a day to go through the whole thing. But what I fundamentally have is the money stock is the sum. Yeah. It's a, the money stock is the sum of what's in the consumer's deposit account, the investment deposit account, the worker's deposit account, and bank's equity. Okay, so that's that's just the balance sheet of the bank. Okay, the I haven't. Yeah. No, that's this is just accounting. But okay. what we want are the behavioural equations. The behaviour is entirely tied up in these time constants here. These, what I have is people spending at a at a certain rate. It's a very monetarist model in that sense. Spending is a function of the amount of money in people's bank accounts and how fast they're spending the money. So it's a strictly monetarist model. In that sense, I have, I haven't, I haven't bothered including real production in the model because it's for illustrative purposes only. I have done it in other models, so I can then have this money turnover given a money wage leading to a certain number of workers being hired, given a certain amount of labour productivity, therefore producing a certain amount of real output. The real output, given the money level price, consequently giving you a equilibrium between supply and demand. That's all been done. Okay. So it's all tied together. It's all a complete, consistent model. I'm sure. Yeah, but it's the behaviour is. I haven't actually tried to specify whether people are trying to maximise the utility or not, because all I want to illustrate is that if I simply change the structure of the model to say banks lend money, banks create money when they lend, rather than saying banks are intermediaries, the whole thing changes. Okay, it's, it's an illustrative model for that point alone. Yeah. Just one question. You mentioned that the, 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 the one question. Yeah. You mentioned that the money stock uh, does not change through the time. Not it doesn't at the moment, it will in thirty seconds. Uh -huh. Yeah, when, okay. when bank starts to Because when bank starts uh, yeah. creating uh, yeah. creating money from, from yeah. credit then yeah, see what I've got at the moment is there's a neoclassical vision that banks are just intermediaries, they don't create money. And in that world, as I showed you, radical variations to the rate of lending had no impact upon the level of economic activity. Now what I'm doing what I'm halfway through doing right now. So the consumption of you have the consumption of worker being basically a function of the deposit they have in yeah, given, those given workers. Given how fast they have to spend because they're workers. Yeah. 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 I see. And you have the consumption of investment, you have the investment done by firms is a function of what? The same sort of thing, the amount of money in their accounts. Also. Yeah. I see. But I could base I do base that in other models on the rate of profit, so I'll show you that in a moment. Uh -huh. Yeah. So basically consumption, uh, so most of the consumption is the one by workers. Yeah. The firms invest and it is a function of the money they have. Yeah. And what else do we have? And it's, uh, so there is this money uh, yeah, circulating, circulating in the economy. And that's what generates these uh, flows of spending. Yep. And those flows of spending are at the same time flows of income. Yep. And based on that income, some of them uh, succeed in accumulating uh, their deposit. Yeah. You see in their deposit growth. Yep. So here in this system, the, the consumer worker uh, they do some saving, yeah. and that's why their stock of deposit, bank deposit, yep. go up, and they use some of it to lend it yep. with the fee, 
to the investors. Yep, that's right. That's what he's That's it. Here. That's it. Yeah. And what I could easily do, I mean, I, the one reason I haven't bothered putting the behavioral stuff inside the model uh -huh. is if I wanted to, um, let's just bring, I'll bring up the model again before I've made changes to it. What I have at the moment is the capacity to vary. Oh, actually, I won't. Let's go back to small screen again. I, what I have at the moment is capacity to vary lending and repayment rates. But if you wanted to model what happens if consumers change their behavior, then all you've got to do, down here I've got consumption by workers. So I'm going to take a copy of that variable, whack it up here, mm -hmm. make it into a slider, and then edit the ranges, and give a range between, say, uh, I've got 0 0.02, which is one week, but let's say workers might go between um, spending their bank accounts over th in three days flat. Mm -hmm or it's been taking as long as, say, um, half a year, 0 0.5, six months, to pay their accounts down. Now, at that level, I can then run the model and see what happens. So you can say, well, let's say workers suddenly are much more conservative. They decide to save money. What actually happens? I'm trying to get my... Okay. Okay. And there's the effect of consumers and workers saving more money. GDP falls. That's the widow's crew. That's the, the curse of, of uh, consumption. If you decide to save money, you spend less money, therefore you make GDP fall. So incomes fall. So it would be quite possible to use this model and have 20 or so people playing with it and changing the behaviour of workers, like I'm doing right now. Because if they save more... They spend less. If they spend less, there's less demand. Demand falls, GDP falls. Okay, but on the other hand, if they have more uh, bank deposit, would they not lend more uh, to the investors? This is—I haven't got the workers' lending here. No. If you want to add that, you can add that in. No. Okay, it's all extensible. No. So, but the main thing I wanted to focus on is just the structural question. Okay? Yeah, yeah. What happens if, in fact, it's not bank, it's not in the consumer sector that lends, but it's the bank that lends? So I'm halfway to doing that. I want to show the difference in those two models. So. Now that I've, I've, you know, I've deleted, what I've done in, in, in the operation of the consumer goods table is I've deleted the debt as an asset of the consumer sector. But because Minsky un understands double entry bookkeeping, the debt is still there as a liability of the investment sector. Okay? So I can now tell Minsky to add a new asset for the banking sector by clicking on that column. And now look and see if you can find an asset, or a liability, pardon me, that hasn't been allocated as an asset to somebody else. Now debt turns up there as the asset. So if I click on debt, then the operations of lending and repayment, and payment of interest, and payment of a fee, turn up in the, in the system. Okay, so having done that, I'm now going to show that the interest payment is made to the banking sector. And I'm going to delete the fee, which is just a fiction. I need to make more changes than that to make the model completely consistent. But having done that alone, when I run the model, you now got a world with a positive growth rate. GDP is growing. If lending happens more rapidly, there's a boom. If repayment happens more slowly, the boom gets bigger. And increasing the amount of debt in the economy increases the amount of money. And then if there's a slowdown in lending, so lending happens more slowly and repayment happens more rapidly, you have a slowdown in growth and potentially have a crisis. And GDP has fallen there. I'm now letting it extend, extend once more. That's making the structural point that acknowledging that banks lend money makes a huge difference to the behaviour of the macro economy. That's why I haven't bothered with all the other expectations. I don't need to. Okay? I could add that in. It wouldn't make any difference to the demonstration I'm making here that a world without, where banks don't create money is a totally different world to the world where they do. And yet the models that mainstream economists have is banks don't create money. So they're modelling a world that doesn't exist. Okay? And when the crisis hit them, it hit them from a causal factor they didn't understand. Because beforehand, remember when I changed the level of um, 
of the debt to GDP ratio and change the amount of debt, there was no impact up here. Okay? Finance in that sense was completely independent from the economics. Now what I've shown you is simply by acknowledging that banks create money when they lend mm -hmm. and that debt is an asset of the banking sector, not an asset of the consumer sector, which is the way the neoclassical model, mm -hmm. utterly different world. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that's a prelude to explaining where the financial crisis came from and why mainstream economists couldn't see it, because they ignored the debt to GDP data. They said it doesn't matter. And they're still saying it 10 years after the crisis. Okay? They still describe anybody, this is Krugman and I had a fight on the internet about 2012. And in that fight, he described me as a, as a, as a banking mystic. Now, if he is a barter mystic, okay? <laughs> He believes in the world in which barter exists, and he's trying to model capitalism that way. No wonder he didn't have a fucking clue the financial crisis was coming. Pardon my French. Um, and the same for mainstream economists. Now, what I'm seeing is the people in the mainstream who are starting to realise this are the, are the economists who work for central banks, because they're the ones who are actually still on the front line. They're still presenting their models to politicians, they're still predicting a return to equilibrium, it's still not happening, it's been happening for a decade. Mm -hmm. So they're finally saying, look, there's something we fundamentally don't understand. And the first ex-mainstream banker who came out with a strong statement like that was Narayana Koshalakota. Have you heard his name? No, I'm Koshal Koshal okay. I'll just find his paper here. He was the head of the Minnesota of the Minneapolis Fed, which is which is the most uh, the most conservative of, of the central banks, really. It was it was the, and he actually coined this little phrase, toy models. He's got a different idea of what I mean, what I mean by toy models. But he was the Fed. He's the president of the Minneapolis Fed. Yeah, he no longer is. He's now. Yeah. It was not due to his. Position, the way I well, he just retired, he reached his term. Okay. Yeah. But over that period, he moved from being a, a very conservative member of the bank to a very progressive member of the bank, worried about the rate of interest, worried about unemployment, and had the courage to come out and make statements like this. So I've got a great deal of respect for him in doing that. It's a huge shift because they, they were the real business cycle. Mm -hmm. He actually, they terminated the positions of some of the real business cycle modelers made them go back to the universities where they do less harm. Well, maybe more harm, hard to say. But here's his paper. He's saying the premise of serious models is a well-established model of macro theory. And this is all the details he gives of that macro theory there. And then he says there are all these decisions about how to model preferences, beliefs and expectations, financial markets, etc., etc. And then he said um, the, the, this is macro modeling is, is engineering. And he then ends up saying down here, if we're trying to find it here, let's see. Okay, this is the key statement. The premise of serious modelling is that macro research can and should be grounded in an established bodily model of theory. My own view is that after the highly surprising nature of the data over the last 10 years, this basic premise is wrong. We simply do not have a settled, successful model of the macro economy. Okay? So I have tremendous respect for somebody who can come out and say that from within the mainstream. You know? And he's, he was doing that, shifting in that direction, while on the FOMC. So that, again, takes a lot of courage to step out of what you were seen as being and, and make those statements. What I'm trying to show is why they're wrong. As soon as you acknowledge that banks create money, the whole world changes. Okay. What, what is his name? Yeah, Koshal Dakota? Um, I don't think I have. Unfortunately, the web, you know how bad the web is here. I don't think I can probably give it. That's that's his name. Let's just grow it up in scale for you. Hang on. Koshal Lakota. Okay. Now, what I want to go to is something that is a successful settled theory of the macroeconomy, and that's Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. So that's the part of the prelude is to show why you've got to have endogenous money to make that make sense. So having gone from the loanable funds model I had beforehand, that one, just going across to acknowledging the banks create money, that's the world you're in. Okay, it's a totally different world. Endogenous money is 
The idea that the banks create money is an essential part of Minsky's hypothesis. Okay. And that's united with the work of other post-Keynesians, such as Basil Moore in particular, where we talk about the role of banks in creating money. And I, now I'm trying to change the term. The term that we've been using for decades is endogenous money. That only makes sense to somebody who knows what the hell we're talking about. Okay. So my preferred term now is bank-originated money and debt, which abbreviates to bond. Okay. So our economies are bond. Bank originated money and debt. When they originate debt, they also originate money. The two go hand in hand. And that makes this, this sort of scale of difference to a structural model of the economy. You know, from, from this, hang on, to that. That's, that's, the, that's the mainstream view. That's the real world. So let's take a look at how the real world operates. Now, it comes back to the expenditure is equal to income argument. And this, this again, I've had a long battle in post-Keynesian post economics to make the importance of saying because money is created by banks, because we're bombed, money is bombed, therefore credit matters in aggregate demand. And for a long time there was there's still resistance to my argument because people say, well, expenditure is income. And it's been argued by some in that frame that therefore when people spend, they spend out of their savings and there's no role for credit. Now, I said that's... If that was true, there'd be no point doing the work we've done. Why would it matter? You've got to show credit has got some role in income. So I want to take you through the role now. Now, you can show that expenditure is, is income, meaning savings do not exist at the macro level. The whole concept of savings is false at the macro level. It actually ends up being income reduction at the macro level, and I'll show you the logic of that. And there are two basic sources of expenditure. There's the turnover of existing money and there's credit. Now, the difference between those two models I showed you was one only had the turnover of existing money. If, if lending was one non-bank lending to another non-bank, then there's no change in the liabilities of the banking sector. And in the definition of money that you can see from Graziani, Money fundamentally is the liabilities of the banking sector to the rest of the economy. So there's no change in the liabilities of the banking sector. There's no money being created. That's the turnover of existing money. But credit is new debt. And when you have a world where the banks create money and create debt at the same time, then the change in debt is identically equivalent to the change in money. And when you borrow that money, you spend the money. You don't borrow it just so you're in debt to the bank. Okay, you don't do it for the fun of it. You borrow the money to spend it, and when you spend that money, that generates additional demand. Mm -hmm. And you can then map that roughly by saying, let's because most of most credit these days is created for asset purchases. Okay, it should be created. It should be created to pr investment. productive investment and necessary consumption, but it's not. It's mainly asset purchases. So for that reason, you can roughly, not accurately, but you can roughly add GDP and change in debt together to get a rough guide of how much demand is being created in the economy and therefore the likelihood of a financial crisis if that slows down. Because roughly 85% of credit of that order is to, to buy assets these days, which is not counted in GDP. So about 15% goes for consumption and investment decisions. So some is, is double counted. But the vision that the mainstream has is that debt is just a pure distribution. It's not. It's a creation of additional spending power. And that's what I've just illustrated to you with that, that particular model in Minsky. So if you leave debt and credit out of your models, you're leaving out the cause of economic activity, the cause of change in economic activity. And you can put it in and you get an immediate indicator of when the crisis is going to occur because it'll occur when you have a high level of private debt compared to income and when that rate of growth, rate of, growth of that ratio is very high and when it stops. And it'll stop because people take on more debt than they're capable of servicing. They'll take on ventures which are going to fail. And when they cease borrowing, the, the drop in borrowing itself causes a crisis. You don't need to have credit turn negative to have a crisis occur. And I want to take you through the logic of that. You can have a crisis just because the rate of growth of debt slows down. Because of aggregate demand is, strictly speaking, as I define it now, 
the turnover of existing money plus credit. And I define credit as the annual change in debt. Now, the reason for using annual change, by the way, comes back to dimensionality. Okay? GDP is defined as dollars per year. Okay? If I'm going to include credit, add the two together, I also have to have credit in dollars per year. Therefore, it's the change in debt on an annual basis. Okay? It's dimensional accuracy that requires me to use those terms. So if I look at turnover of existing money per year, and I want to get aggregate demand, I've got to add in credit per year, which is change in debt per year, all for dimensional accuracy. It's not, it's not a question of getting the time periods right, as a lot of people in post Keynesian. It's dimensionality. And that's one of the most important concepts engineers are very familiar with that economists are almost completely ignorant about. And I'm wanting to make sure the next generation isn't the same way. And the way you measure credit if you want to do some empirical studies yeah. is that you just look at the change in the stock of outstanding bank loans. Over one year. Over one That's year. right. But yeah. these are bank loans. Mm -hmm. This doesn't include the credit that is given by all kinds of shadow no. banking. No. But the, the funny thing is that a lot of the shadow banks are themselves financed by banks. So I tend to use the total debt data because when you look at where a lot of these non-bank financial institutions came from, they were means the banks used to evade controls on lending back in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a lot of the finance for these non-banks is actually money they borrowed from banks themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to use the raw debt data for of financial institutions to banks. Mm -hmm. But I looked at that very closely. And unfortunately, as the tables are defined at the eight-digit level of accuracy, mm -hmm. they lump together bank loans and non-bank loans. You simply can't use the data. So what I do as a second best is to say, well, what we call shadow banks have actually been financed by actual banks, and the total change in debt... Of banks. Of, of, should capture everything. Oh, the, the total... No, what, what's recorded as total debt will include all money created by banks. All this money we call shadow bank money is literally a shadow. I'm going to lend this person some money through this person's pocket. Here's your money. <laughs> Okay? It's that sort of behaviour. It's a shadow. You can't see me, but I'm lending her money. But okay? You should see me when I feel good. Okay. So that's... That's a shadow bank. Yes. Made my point? So you just I at the possibility I do. accounts of the banking sector... And well, the, I'm, using, I'm using a Bank of International Settlements data. Oh. And that is extremely good data. I mean, the BIS... Uh, this is where I've, I've, there's only a very few people in official positions that I dip my cap to. One is Bill White. Bill White was the research director for the Bank of International Settlements all the way through the crisis. And Bill, literally twice a year, found himself in the same room as Alan Greenspan, mm -hmm. arguing effectively Minsky's financial instability hypothesis to Greenspan. And the way that I came to discover this was I was I saw the crisis coming from. 2006. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a historical uh, story, but I, I was working on, uh, I was contracted to do a expert witness case for a law case involving predatory lending, and I hadn't looked at the, the debt data for almost a decade because I'd finished my PhD, which is on Minsky, and I had looked at the debt levels back then but I'd then gone into writing debunking economics. And then I got involved in a huge battle with the mainstream over uh, the theory of the firm, competition, policy, and all this stuff on competitive markets, perfect competition, et cetera, et cetera. And I was going to write my PhD as a book for Edward Elgar, and I hadn't got around to it. And by 2005, roughly December 2005, I thought I'd finished all that. And then I got approached by the Legal Aid Commission in Australia to be the expert witness on a case of a predatory loan organised by a solicitor, so it was shadow banking, to a guy who used to be a truck driver employed by a company, and the company privatised its operations, sacked all its workers and rehired them as independent contractors. And this guy, the amount of money he earned as an independent contractor was nowhere near what he got as a wage beforehand. So he started to fall in arrears on his loans to the um, to his bank, which was then the Commonwealth Bank in Australia. And he went to all the other banks, and they all turned him down. So on this particular basis, they were 
valid because his income had fallen so much he could no longer afford the loan he had. The loan was of the order of, I think it was about $100,000. Okay. Um, so the, all the banks turned him down. He was desperate. He went to a solicitor whose nickname is Criminalizer. I won't mention his actual name. That was his nickname, Criminalizer. And he happily arranged third-party loans with so-called shadow banks. Now, in one of those loans, there were seven loans in a row that he organised for this guy over 18 months. And over that 18-month period, his debt went from about $100,000 to $260,000. And in the last one of those loans, he was charged $15,000 for the contract fee. Okay? They wiped the guy out. They didn't give him an eighth loan because by that stage, the amount of money he owed was equivalent to the value of the house. Then they went after the house. So I got asked to come in as an expert witness, and the basis of that was to argue that uh, normally judges are very, very unwilling to overturn a contract. The, the, the role of judges is to enforce contracts, not to write them off. So my case was that the, the reason a, a judge will agree to um, destroy a contract is the contract has deleterious impacts upon third parties. So my case was to say allowing loans like this will cause a financial crisis that affects the rest of the economy and therefore should not be allowed for that reason. And the judge agreed with me. We actually won the case. But it only got the guy out of the seventh loan. He still was stuck with the other six that had already gone through. And they ended up living in a tent for a while as well. So in the middle of doing all that, I looked at this financial data again. And I was horrified you know, how, how bad it was. Uh, so that's why I said a crisis is coming as of the middle of December, December 18, roughly 2005. I said there's obviously a crisis coming, and I'll show you the data that made me see that. So I started reading, again, all the, uh, not just academic reports, but also reports like the Bank of International Settlements. And I'd read the IMF, I'd read the World Bank, I'd read the OECD, and I would be laughing, you know. I virtually have to go and get a joint to cope with how crazy this stuff was, all this wonderful future coming our way, and I thought, they've got no idea, you know? So I, I got a copy of the Bank of International Settlements, and I open it in the same expectation, I'm going to read this nonsense, and I'm reading it going, holy shit, I could have written this. I'll see if I can find one of the reports. Let's see. Ah, come on, the mouse takes a while to react. Uh, B-I-S... Let's see. I'm not sure of these. I'll actually go go to uh, the file location and take a look inside there. But the Bank of International Settlements reports were talking about the probability of a financial crisis, financial instability. I haven't... A BIS quarterly, maybe that's there. Let's see. Debt reduction after crises. Okay, that, this is all after the crisis, but the BIS reports before the crisis were the only official documents that had any idea the crisis was coming. Mm -hmm. And so Bill White was making all these statements before before the crisis that it was going there was going to be one. So they were fabulous. <coughs> but in the majority, the mainstream completely ignored this crisis. So I'd forgotten why I got into the uh, side effect about Bill, Bill White, but. Most formal bodies had no idea of this crisis coming up. The Bank of International Settlements had this idea, then after Bill retired, he now works for the OECD, um, the bank has continued that tradition of improving the data they have on credit. And what they've done is got a standardised set of accounts for the central bank, so they all report using the same standards. So the BIS data is comparable across countries. Uh, <coughs> whereas if you look at, for example, the Australian... Reserve Bank of Australia, the way it declares the level of private debt in its own accounts, it's about 180% of GDP. The way it declares the debt in the BIS accounts is 210% of GDP. I'd rather trust the BIS. So that's why I go with BIS data. So all this data is freely downloadable from the Bank of International Settlements. <coughs> and I've got all the data links for you in the presentation. So but let's go back to the example here. So you're looking at a low level of debt and let's imagine you have an economy where, imagine GDP is a trillion dollars a year and credit's 100% used to buy assets, that sort of world, okay? So you start with a GDP of a trillion dollars a year and it's growing at 10% per annum, which is fairly realistic, the level of rate of growth of nominal GDP before the crisis. 
And let's say it's private debt is 50% of GDP, which means $500 billion, which is the level it used to be back in the 50s and 60s. And that's growing at 20% per annum. Again, these are quite realistic figures in terms of ranges. So in that particular dear year, with debt starting at $500 billion, it'll grow by 20% of $500 billion, which is $100 billion. And you add the two together to get total demand, $1.1 trillion. Okay? Now, next year, if GDP continues growing at the same rate, I'm just assuming it will, that'll be $1.1 trillion GDP. If growth of debt slows down to the same rate of growth as GDP itself, so the debt to GDP ratio stabilises, it'll grow at 10%. 10% of $600 billion is $60 billion. You add the two together and you get a total of demand of $1.16 trillion, which is $60 billion more than the year before. Okay? All follow that? So in that particular case, there's been a slowdown in the rate of growth of debt, but aggregate demand still rises the following year. What about when you have a debt level of 200% of GDP? Well, that means your initial level of debt is $2 trillion, because GDP is $1 trillion, so debt's $2 trillion. 20% of $2 trillion is $400 billion a year. Now, that's a booming economy. That might be the Celtic tiger like Ireland or Spain, okay? Booming economy. Much, much bigger GDP than the one that doesn't have the same level of credit creation. So they can look like they're really successful economies. Total demand of therefore be 1.4 trillion, much higher than the one I showed you with the lower level of debt. Next year, turnover of GDP of money grows by the same amount, 10%, so 1.1 trillion, same as the other example. Growth of debt slows to 10%, same as the other example. 10% of 2.4 trillion, because there's going to be 400 billion added to this. 10% of that's going to be $240 billion. You add that to your GDP of $1.1 trillion. Your total demand is now $1.34 trillion, $60 billion lower than the year before. So you, I didn't even have credit going negative, and I still got a downturn in aggregate demand. Now, that particular economy is going to have a slump in demand, whether it's in the asset markets or the goods markets or both. Okay? So that if you leave this out of your thinking, you're not going to see this coming at all. If you include credit in your thinking, you're going to be forewarned of it. And that's why, again, the Bank of International Settlements was the only organisation that saw this coming, courtesy of Bill White, and this is why I saw it coming, courtesy of Hyman Minsky. And we both, of course, were fans of Hyman Minsky, which we, we've since met, of course. So you've got to look at both at the level of private debt to GDP and the rate of growth of debt. They're both essential. You can't understand it out without the other. And this little shorthand of mine is moderately, reasonably accurate. There's going to be an error in adding GDP to change in debt, but we don't have any recording of turnover of existing money. We, we could do it these days. If you think about electronic funds transfer, which we all use, you know, credit cards to, to shop, you could actually tell whether a transaction was from credit cards or from savings accounts. You could actually record turnover of existing money now versus credit. You could do it, but it's not done by the statistical agency. So all I can do is take GDP and add that to credit. But when you do it, you get a fairly good guide as to what's going to happen. So here's, again, thanking Claudio Borio and friends for continuing on Bill's good work. That's the data files. And I do an analysis of this on my website uh, where I put it all together, the set of charts for the 43 countries that they have data for as of, as of um, the third quarter of 2006. Now here's the United States, and what I'm doing in this chart, I'll just stop it for a second and talk it through. Actually, I I can freeze it. I think I can actually do that. Ah, I can't freeze it. Okay. What I've got here is the, the red line is GDP. The blue line is GDP plus change in debt in that year, which is therefore credit. And the black line is G change in debt divided by GDP. So I'm graphing the sum, the, the blue and the red line are graphed on the left-hand axis. So that's 20 trillion US dollars at the top, $5 trillion down here. The right-hand axis is this percentage of GDP. And it is between, goes between minus 20, <coughs> because some countries have got a slump that big, and plus 60, because some countries had that much of an increase in private debt in one year. 
so it's a standardized scale for all the countries. And you can see the financial crisis in America began when the rate of growth of, of, credit, of debt, which is credit, fell from about 15% of GDP in 2008 to minus 5%, pretty much minus 6 in 2010. And then there's been a recovery since then. So you go from 15% of GDP plus 15 to minus 5, and the recovery that's occurred largely because they're back borrowing money once more. Yeah? Sorry, uh, as a non-economic student, I have to ask about this minus, minus sign. Minus credit. credit. Minus credit. Yeah. yeah, that's because what I'm looking at, the change in debt on an annual basis. So if, if credit, if, if debt is rising, the change in debt is positive. Uh -huh. But if debt is falling, the change in debt is negative. So you get a negative figure for it. And it's extreme. The, the financial crisis is the first time that's happened since uh, 1929. Actually, 1936, 37. So the only times in America's recorded history since 1920 that there's been negative credit, 1930 to 32, 33, and then 1936 to 38. Okay? There was a bit of a negative credit, I think, in the, at the time of the... Um, uh, demobilization from the Second World War. This is England's data back to 1960 and again the dotted line is where change in debt is zero. So they had a bit of a negative experience back in the early 60s. They had another one in the 1990s roughly, close to negative. Then they hit the crisis and down they go and they've been bouncing up and down all over the place. I think it reflects how much money laundering goes on in the Bank of England and the city in the, in the the City of London, as much as anything else. But there's incredible volatility now in credit in the UK, currently positive, which is why the economy hasn't slumped after Brexit. This is Norway. Now, Norway thinks it avoided a crisis. It actually had a period of negative credit there, as you can see, but it's bounced back into positive credit, and it's now running an enormous level of private debt. And I'll show you the, the data for that. Uh, a bit later tomorrow. Here's the level of private debt compared to GDP in those countries, including Norway. And what you can see is this trend from a very low level, rising substantially, reaching a peak after the crisis for those countries that had a crisis back in 2008, and then falling. Norway is one of the countries that continued borrowing money. So its debt level is now about 245% of GDP. Now, I can get away with that debt level to some extent because it runs a trade surplus. Okay? There's a way in which a trade surplus balances um, the impact of a high level of private debt because there's, there's three ways you can create money. Okay? Banks can lend out more than they get back in repayments. The government can spend more than it taxes and you can export more than you import. All three create ways to create money. One, the banks are literally creating it into your private bank account. The second, the government is putting more money into your account by spending than it's taking out by tax. And the third is, if you run an export surplus, you present foreign currency to your central bank that credits you with the equivalent in domestic currency in your account and hangs onto those foreign reserves as money as its own reserves. Mm -hmm. So if you're running a trade surplus like, like Germany is doing, of 10% of GDP, then that much money is ending up in the firm sector created by its exports. It doesn't need to borrow money to finance investment. It's getting it from its export surplus. Okay. Same for the household sector. So you look at Germany's data, and I can't show you because of the bad internet connection here, but Germany's had a declining level of private debt to GDP for the last 15 years because it's had such a rising export surplus. It's more than compensated, so the government's been running a surplus and so the household sector, which they can do because the foreign sector has provided them with the money. So that's the world we're in. And I want to cover... We're supposed to finish at 4 o'clock, aren't we? Yes. Can you handle a bit longer and then leave it at that? Because I want to go through why does austerity lead to the sort of crises we're seeing? Because, again, the vision we have of austerity is we can all save money. No, we can't. And I want to show you logically why that's the case. You, you can't think about it except by looking at in aggregate terms, because what always happens is, again, influenced by neoclassical economics, we extrapolate the individual to the collective. 
So we think if I can save money, we should all save money. No, it doesn't work that way. So I want to show you a little monetary unit I call Tom, Dick, Harrier. And I'm using Tom, Dick and Harry because that's a common expression in English of three average people. Tom, Dick and Harry. Okay. So Tom, Dick and Harry are staunch Republicans and they're not they're all bright individually, but they can work things out together. And one day they realise, by looking at the data, that the government's never going to run a surplus. And this is the data for America for its surplus since 1900. And the top dotted line there is zero. And the bottom dotted line is the average for the entire one and a half, one and a quarter centuries. And across the entire period, the average deficit has been 2.4% of GDP. And if you look at the post-World War I period, it's 2.1% of GDP. So even though the government's tried to run a surplus, that's what it's been its belief what it should do, it's run a deficit averaging more than 2% of GDP. And if you leave out the world wars, the average is still about 2.1%. So the average situation for one and a quarter centuries is a deficit. And this is a bunch of Republicans who think the government should run a surplus. So we're going to run a surplus. Okay. So they form their own country called Tom Dick Harrier. And each of them start off with $100. So the total money supply is $300. Okay. And they each spend $100 each year on each other. So Tom spends $100 buying goods produced by Dick and another $100 spending Dick's goods produced by Harry. This is the turnover of money. Okay? So we're starting from this situation. What that means is Tom's expenditure is 200. Dick's expenditure is 200. Harry's is 200. So aggregate expenditure is the negative of the diagonal, $600 per year. Now aggregate income is the sum of the off-diagonal elements, which is necessarily $600 per year. Now, I want to work out the total situation. There's income, there's expenditure, savings of zero for each of them. Okay? But they've all decided they're going to have savings targets. They're all going to try to save money. So this is strictly showing that macroeconomic identity expenditure is income, starting from that point of view. The aggregate savings is zero. Now, Tom is the first to attempt to run a surplus. So Tom decides he's going to run a surplus of 5% of his GDP. Now his GDP is, is $200 a year, so 5% of $200 is $10 a year. So he's decided he's going to run a surplus of $10. How does he do that? He spends $5 less of each on Dick and Harry. Now he does that, so he now finds, yes, his expenditure is 190 his income is 200 he's got a surplus of 10 Fabulous. Not so crash off for Dick and Harry. They're now getting $5 less income each, still spending the same amount. They're running deficits of 5% of GDP, which they didn't plan to do. So Tom's surplus of $10 means aggregate GDP drops by $10. That is not a coincidence. Expenditure has dropped by 10 therefore GDP has dropped by 10 Tom is say so his savings have caused the fall in GDP. It's an identity. Aggregate savings remains at zero. Now, Dick and Harry have all agreed to try to run a surplus. They think, well, they're going to restore a balanced budget, but what a $5 deficit. Let's spend five, let's spend five dollars less ourselves each year. So if they do that, they're now spending 97.5 on each other and on, on Tom. But they're therefore each spending five dollars, two and a half dollars less than each other than they were beforehand. So they haven't got back to balance again. They've still got a deficit, but they've reduced Tom's to five. So how does Tom respond? Well, what's happened now? Aggregate GDP is now 580. It's fallen by another 10, exactly equal to the fall in expenditure. They've all failed to meet their savings targets, and aggregate savings are still zero. But sorry, I have to, I have to say back yeah. for the neoclassical view, um, you, they don't take into account that you take your savings and just put it, as the Germans say, under your metrics, you know? Yeah, but or you should, under your, you, you should know, be, you should be, yeah. You but should see, be. if I did that, what I, what I would have is a changing velocity of money for Tom. So Tom potentially would be having more money and therefore with a fixed velocity spending more because he got more money in his account. 
But at the same time, yeah, if yeah, like you, 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 you put it on the bank, so so you get interest. So after a while, your income increases as well. Well, this bring, is bring the, the idea behind the idea. You can bring a banking sector in as well. But what what you show is if you have an attempt to say, huh? There's one more crisis in my yeah. country in Ukraine. After this revolution of dignity uh, that was taking place a few years ago, you know, a lot of banks, about 20 banks go just bankrupt, you know? Yeah. You know, I had just a little bit to save and it was just... Uh, eliminated. Uh, eliminated and afterwards just, I, had, I couldn't just uh, turn even just a half of the sum, you know, for instance, you know? Yeah, yeah. In this way, it's not a good idea, especially in some kind of countries that are in, especially in transition, to my mind, and to the countries that uh, takes... Uh, uh, they take uh, usually some kind of austerity measures, mm. um, just uh, to save money on a deposit this way, I suppose. It's, it's pretty risky stuff, you know? Yeah. Pretty risky in this way that uh, all these uh, interest rates, have, they have uh, been dropping down from time to time. Yeah. And uh, afterwards, uh, even a lot of uh, banks, I mean, uh, commercial banks uh, with foreign capital, they just shut down, you know, in the country, and then they don't want to cooperate with the government, yeah. government yeah. and local authority, you know. So yeah. yes. Yeah. But e equally, what I'm trying to illustrate is an attempt to save at the individual level. It directly causes a fall in demand unless there's compensating changes in other directions. And if I included, uh, if if you include. Um, like putting the money in a bank account, earning interest off the bank money is still. If you put ten dollars aside and you're getting five percent interest on that, you've got a fifty cent increase in your income in response of your ten dollar increase in the stock of money that you're being owed. If you spend the same fraction of that, that's a dollar more you're going to spend back in. You've still dropped your spending by nine dollars. So you can't compensate for the decline in expenditure. And this this is okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just another just notion. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, also, the, the situation is that uh, in such uh, cases, in such uh, how to say this, austerity measures, uh, the national or central bank doesn't take any measures or some kind of efficient yeah. way. Yeah. It's also, for instance, in my country, it's also very corrupted and very bureaucratic yeah. institution. You know, and all this. Philippines like that in other countries too. Yes, exactly that. As, as I told him you before, they take all of this borrowings from IMF and yeah. different other uh, technical do donors for the country, for instance. Yeah. But the country, under all this uh, uh, debt, just uh, foreign debt and internal debt, yeah. it's uh, risen just uh, tremendously in recent times, for instance. Yeah. And uh, it's just made just country just put in port uh, across the, the whole country, you know? Yeah. yeah. So it is, yeah. Yeah. So what you get, the whole process here is, is showing, ex because expenditure is income, the attempt by everybody to save money reduces GDP by as much as they save. So the whole concept of savings at the national level is a fallacy. Okay. And what, what's defined as savings is largely absorbed by financial expenditure. So if I, if I keep on doing this process, I want to show the, the final end of you. We finally get to the stage where they all um, get back to balance again. They end up all being still zero savings. What they've done is slowed down the return over of money. They've slowed down demand. That's been the real impact of doing it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes, but uh, I want to just to add something to what she said. Mm. You have a savings, but if they put that in the bank, you have like we can. You forgot the the, the side of investments. You don't have a. So if you put a bank, it's how bank can uh, like uh, create a loan or just. If I had investment, in, so I could I could, I could treat Tom, Dick, and Harry as the consumption sector, the investment sector, and the real estate sector. I'm just using but Tom, Dick, and Harry for labels. And if you do that, if you say you you put the money aside, if you put it aside, you you reduce demand today. How do you know in the investment sector that's going to increase demand in the future? We don't know that, but you don't exactly. And that's yeah. the risky part. Like of it's, course, yeah. it is risky, but, but like risk yeah. doesn't only mean yeah. that it's going down. Risk also means that you're going to have something. Yeah, risk but we always yeah. it be also very speculative. It, yes, it yeah. is. As as you like, for me, like I, to be like, it is always yeah. like people. Okay, no, <laughs> but it's yeah. like it's not just one way. It's always. Yeah. But see, this, but, but the point, this, this is a model which is more complete so, in that sense. In this model of this is the one I, I rapidly added the capacity to change how fast workers consume. Now, if I have workers, if workers decide, if workers are consuming, consuming very rapidly. Uh, what happened there? Okay, workers are consuming very rapidly in this model. 
and if I now say let's have workers consuming more slowly, what actually happens? Hang on, with this mouse properly located. This mouse doesn't seem to like. Let's try this way. Hang on. Yeah. Okay. The the decision for the workers to consume less means incomes fall. You can see the incomes on the chart there. And that's that all the feedbacks you're talking about are inside there. You're getting rapid changes in the velocity of money, big changes in consumption. But the attempt to save money slows down its rate of circulation. Unless you're creating more money, you're not going to finance that expansion we're talking about. So if you're going to have aggregate savings occurring, you've got to have non-bank debt being created. So I've had Again, I'll, let's just go back and I'll start that again. I'll try to get this mouse working properly. Run this more slowly. I'm trying to get the, the arrow keys don't seem to work on this particular mouse, unfortunately. But at the moment there, I've got incomes for workers' wages uh, 170 dollars per, per year, if we now increase the amount, uh, have workers consuming more slowly, then what happens in response to them saving is their incomes fall. They're now getting $140 per year. And if they save more slowly again, the same story, aggregate income is fall. Yeah. 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 So that's that's the point that I'm illustrating that, and that's that's a more complete illustration of what I'm showing you on the table. But the whole idea you have to have savings before you can have investment. I've shown you in the aggregate savings are zero. Okay? Because you can't save money into existence. If you want to have investment finance, you've got to create money. The policy of the expensive money. Pardon? The policy of the expensive money. Expensive money, or I actually say you want not expensive money, but expansive money. Yes. You want money being increased in the volume. Okay. And you want that. Of course, the private sector will do it itself. Create. Okay. But if you have investment expanding the amount of money, if you have if banks expanding money for investment purposes then you can have that financing growth in the economy. Okay. But you've got to have the money created in the first instance. And we think savings creates money. What savings does is take is slow down the rate of circulation of money in existence. And if you slow down the rate of circulation of money in existence, you're going to reduce monetary demand now, whatever you might intend doing with the money in the future. So unless people can tell, and this was Keynes's point in the general theory as well, unless people can tell that the fact that you're saving now means you're going to have a greater demand in the future, mm -hmm. and therefore they invest because of a fall in demand now, mm -hmm. they will therefore invest, mm -hmm. you're not going to get balance, you're going to get a slump. And that's what I've been illustrating with those, with that example and those models. And I haven't even spoken about Minsky's financial instability hypothesis yet. That's going to have to be tomorrow morning. Okay? Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.